I work as a prosecutor in that jurisdiction. Um, and I'm chair of uh, the programming committee uh, for this conference. Um, the chair of the criminal justice section is Sandy Weinberg. Sandy was unable to make it here today, but on Sandy's behalf, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to what is our ninth annual uh, Prescriptions for Criminal Justice Forensics Conference. Um, we are co-sponsored by John Jay College of Criminal Justice, the American Academy of Forensic Science, the Legal Aid Society of New York, uh, the uh, Innocence Project, CSAFE, and ASCLAD. And on behalf of um, our co-sponsors, we have a couple of uh, people representing some of those uh, some of those groups that are present with us here today. In um, in a couple of minutes, I'm going to uh, I'm going to introduce him in uh, uh, greater detail. But at this time, I would like to call on the past president of the American Academy of Forensic Science, uh, Ken Melson, to say a couple of words uh, on behalf of the president of AAFS, Susan Ballou. Thank you and good morning. Uh, I'm Ken Melson, as uh, he has indicated. I'm a past president of the Academy back in 2003 timeframe. And I'm here on behalf of Sue Ballou, who is the current president of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences and will be hosting the next meeting in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, which is all a lot closer here than the other ones have been. So hopefully you will be attending that conference. Uh, Sue Ballou is going to be an excellent president and will help advance forensic science through the Academy as she has done all her life. Uh, interestingly, at least for me, she and I started our careers together in the third quarter of the last century when I was um, a state prosecutor in Virginia and she was a serologist in the Virginia uh, Crime Laboratory. She now, as you may know, is at NIST and she's the program manager for forensic science research, um, which will tie into what we'll be doing in this panel a little bit because she was the program manager over that over the research we've done in handwriting as well as the previous one in uh, fingerprint uh, expertise. So the Academy, as you know, uh, is a multidisciplinary organization and it's unique among all the forensic science organizations because we have a jurisprudence section made up of defense attorneys, prosecutors, and uh, judges. And that makes it unique because we try and bring together all the stakeholders in the forensic science community. So Sue wants to uh, thank the ABA and the other partners for this program for doing the same thing and allowing us to work with you all to bring together uh, the various stakeholders in the forensic science community. And she wants to thank each of them and, and Matt in particular, uh, as well as each of you for what, being willing to come and engage in a dialogue and discussion about the improvement of forensic science. So I want to thank you all again and thank our partners and hopefully we'll see you at the Academy meeting in Baltimore next February. Thank you. We're very fortunate to have Ken participate uh, in this conference not just as uh, I'm about to introduce him as a moderator but also as a member of our uh, planning committee. Um, we also are fortunate to have another member of our planning committee uh, who is also um, here to, to greet you as uh, in another capacity. Matthew Gamut is the president of the American Society of Crime Lab Directors, ASCLAD, and he is also chair of the Consortium of Forensic Science Organizations uh, otherwise referred to as CFSO, 
I'm going to, going to introduce him in greater detail later, but right now I would ask Matthew to come up and welcome you. So I would like to thank Matt as well. Um, we serve uh, on the planning committee for this meeting. ASCOT has been involved, I think, since the inception of this event. I know I've been involved for about the last five years, and then we had another representative before that. We're grateful to be here and, and be able to introduce topics um, that practitioners can come in and educate the attorneys and all those others who come into this meeting. We represent about 600 laboratory directors and leaders from across the country and also internationally. Uh, we are very interested in our agenda this year is advancing forensic science. That's our theme for the whole year. You'll notice that we've done several things uh, along that theme this year. We've instituted several new committees, um, one that's kind of split into three to implement rapid DNA across the country in the right way with the right standards, with the right approach, and also looking at uh, novel psychoactive substances and a, a great big initiative that we're partnering with the American Academy and others on. Our initiatives this year are, uh, as we've talked about a lot at, uh, at this meeting before, accreditation and looking at boots on the ground help for labs that are trying to do accreditation. Big initiative on that this year and also on standards implementation. We're looking at some of the things that are coming out of OSAC and internationally. You'll hear more about that this afternoon during uh, the panel that we're, we're producing for this meeting. But we're very excited about some of those things. And also you've seen some of our other work already and you'll continue to see it. Uh, through our Forensic Resource Committee, looking at different things to advance forensic science and crowdsourcing validations and other things to, to improve forensic science. There's more focus on publishing. There's more focus on um, validations being published, and we're, we're grateful about that. You'll also see we just had our symposium. Ken announced their symposium coming up in Baltimore um, in February. We just had ours, and we will be putting all of the, the topics and the talks from that meeting online on our website, so you're able to go and, and review those presentations that were given there on many of the topics that, about advancing forensic science as well. And the proceedings will be published in a journal as well. We're extremely proud of our partnership with the American Bar Association. We're excited to see where it's going to go in the future for more educational opportunities to, to network with you. And um, if there's anything I can do for you while you're here, I hope that you will engage with me and and we can have some discussions about uh, how we can partner even, even more effectively. So thank you for your time and thank you for your attendance. And I would be remiss if I didn't uh, thank the members of our planning uh, committee. Uh, Alicia Karakwiri, you heard from yesterday. Uh, Sarah Chu from the Innocence Project. Dana Delger from the Innocence Project. <clears throat> Bruce Green, who um, teaches here at uh, the Lewis Stein Center for Law and Ethics at Fordham Law School. Uh, Larry Kobolinski, who many of you may know from John Jay uh, College of Criminal Justice. David Loftus from Legal Aid Society uh, um, of New York. Uh, Melissa Morges, you heard from yesterday from the Manhattan DA's office. Hal Stern from the University of California at Irvine, and Pauline Weaver from the law offices of Pauline A. Weaver. So I want to thank uh, the planning group for their, their work, their good work, in uh, organizing and putting together this conference. And at this time, and right on time, uh, I want to uh, introduce the moderator for our, our panel. You've already heard from him. Uh, prior to retiring from the Justice Department in uh, 2012, Ken Melson was a senior advisor on forensic science in the Office of Legal Policy for the Department of Justice. He also served as co-chair of the Subcommittee on Forensic Science, the Committee on Science of the uh, National Science and Technology Council within the Executive Office of the President. He was instrumental in creating the National Commission on Forensic Science at the Justice Department and the Organization of uh, Scientific Area Committees at NIST. 
He's a past president of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences and a distinguished fellow. He was the chair of the uh, Academy's Ethics Committee, uh, currently serves on the editorial board of the Journal of Forensic Sciences. He's a past chair of the Council of Scientific Society Presidents and served on its Ethics Committee. And he also served on the NIST uh, expert human factors working group on handwriting examination. And I'll invite Ken to introduce his panelists. Um, we're going to give you a sneak preview of it because it hasn't been published yet. Um, I, I guess it's still being unclassified, but Melissa may be um, uh, able to talk more about that. Uh, so we're going to talk specifically about the report entitled Forensic Handwriting Examination and Human Factors improving the practice through a systems approach. And that was uh, done through a working group provided by NIST that included a wide range of individuals. And M Melissa will describe that in more detail as well. All four of us on this panel were on the working group. So you'll have the personal insight of uh, our three panelists here and various aspects of the report. So our first speaker is going to be Melissa Taylor. She is a senior forensic science research manager within the special programs office at NIST. And her efforts focus primarily on impression and pat pattern evidence-based uh, research, improving forensic science management practices and integrating human factors principles into forensic science. And she's going to talk about the uh, human factors working group, about what human factors are and what an important role they play, uh, our working group, and the handwriting analysis process called the process map. Our second speaker will be Brett Bishop. Uh, we're very glad to have him. He's come all the way from the Washington State Patrol Laboratory uh, in Spokane, Washington, where he's a supervisor of the uh, firearms and tool mark, latent print, and question document area. And he is also an expert in question document examination and latent fingerprint comparison. He's a member of a number of forensic science organizations and is a member of the question document subcommittee of OSAC. Uh, he's going to discuss the process map for handwriting, how one compares handwritings, and he'll also talk about quality assurance and some other matters. And Dana Delger is our third speaker. We're very happy to have her from the Innocence Project. Uh, she is with the Strategic Litigation, um, and I'm going to have to pull up the rest of it on my cell phone, which is still working, fortunately. Uh, she's a staff attorney at the Strategic Litigation Unit at the Innocence Project, where she focuses on the misapplication of forensic sciences. Prior to joining the Innocence Project, she worked as a public defender and in private practice as a criminal defense attorney, as well as a law clerk to the Honorable Rosemary S. Uh, Pooler on the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, and she's also uh, worked on a number of um, exonerations, which I think we can all be proud of, and particularly Dana and the Innocence Project. She's going to talk about report writing, the expert testimony, the duty to correct, and other legal aspects of the report which we wrote. So with my pleasure, I would like to turn it over to Melissa to introduce uh, the group and the concept of human factors in handwriting analysis. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about human factors. Um, and uh, introduce the Human Factors Working Group series, and then I'm going to kick it over to two of the members of the working group to sort of give you an overview of some of the recommendations that are forthcoming in the report that's yet to be produced. So uh, human factors is sort of a buzzword. Raise your hand if you've heard something about it in forensic science that you know, people start talking about it, right? So, um, you know, the commission has a human factors working group. NIST has this expert uh, working group series. OSAC has a human factors commission. It seems like everyone wants something to do with human factors, right? But what does that really mean? What is it that we're talking about? Um, 
So this is the official, one of the official definitions of uh, human factors. It's, uh, it has an overarching goal um, uh, to optimize human well-being and overall system performance. Uh, human factors research has resulted in significant reductions in errors and accidents in other high-risk industries, such as aviation, healthcare, mining, and uh, nuclear power. But what does that system, in the definition, there was a the term system, what does a system mean? Um, well, when you want to know what something means, you go to Merriam-Webster, so I did. Uh, it's, they define system as a regularly interacting or independent group of items forming a unified whole. Um, and then I added a little bit, you know, what is a complex system? Uh, has many interactive parts. Um, it's difficult, and if not impossible, to predict the behavior of the system based on knowledge of its components part. Right, so the increased system complexity, the more complex it is, the increased there, uh, the, there's an increased chance that something could go wrong, right? And um, from my perspective, crime laboratories are uh, complex systems. So as I said before, Human Factors is concerned with both human and system performance. Historically, there have been two approaches uh, to looking at error. There's the person approach and the systems approach. So the person approach is just as it sounds, right? The person is the focus, um, and it sees errors as a product of carelessness. And uh, some of the measures that are taken to counteract um, those errors are uh, what we call the blame, shame, and retrain approach, right? You find the person, you either retrain them or if it's you know, particularly egregious, you fire them, right? This is that the error is caused by the people involved. So there's a lot of research that talks about why this uh, person approach doesn't work. Well, the first thing is that most people don't wake up in the morning saying, I'm going to go to work and I'm going to make an error that's going to lead a plane to crash or a train to crash, et cetera, right? That there are only a very small minority of cases where um, people are making deliberate mistakes, right? The countermeasures create this false sense of security, right? They think, oh, we fired Jane or Ken and um, we, uh, uh, and we fix the problem, right, when there are lots of other people in the system that are doing the same problem, the same thing. Um, and it doesn't actually solve the problem. It might actually make it worse, right? It incentivizes people to cover up the error, right, because there's this fear that they're going to be blamed and shamed when something happens. And the systems approach can be visually understood by using Reason's Swiss cheese model. Again, can you raise your hand if you've seen this Swiss cheese model before? Good, so quite a few of you. Okay, so for those of you who haven't seen it, um, or may still be fuzzy on the concept, I'm gonna go over it a bit. So the model states that in any system, there are many levels of defense, but these defenses are imperfect, both because you know the inherent uh, human infallibility or fallibility and weaknesses in how the systems are designed and operated. Um, Reason's model also distinguishes between active and latent failures. Active failures are errors or violations that are committed by the people doing work. That's the front end of the system. And then you have latent conditions that result from poor system design um, made by people higher up in the management chain. So latent conditions lead to weaknesses in the organization's defense thus increasing the likelihood that when active failures occur, they will combine with existing preconditions uh, and breach the system's defenses and result in an organizational failure. The holes represent latent active uh, failures that have breached successive levels of defense. When the error penetrates all the way through, through all of the levels of defense, an adverse event would happen, right? So in the case of forensic science, this might result um, in an incorrect conclusion being reported. So just to recap, again, there are these two things, right? The person approach uh, looks at um, errors as a result of human failures, right? There's this idea that perfect performance is the expectation and that retraining and punishment are the only way to sort of solve this issue. And then on the other hand, there's a systems approach that begins with this premise that anything can go wrong and will go wrong. Um, it doesn't expect humans to perform perfectly because that's impossible. Um, and it mandates that organizations have a preoccupation with the possibility of failure. They're always looking for it, right? 
And the system's approach holds that efforts to catch human errors before they occur or blocking them from causing harm will ultimately be the fr more fruitful than ones that seek to somehow create the flawless practitioner, right? The person who comes to work every day, fully motivated, always ready to work, and makes no mistakes. Right? It also focuses on the idea that learning from errors can help to prevent them from reoccurring. So the systems approach actually provides um, a great lens to look through, uh, looking th that forensic science through. So one of the areas of research um, that comes from this uh, human factors is again this preoccupation with failure. <laughs> Um, has allowed other industries to identify factors that are commonly involved in errors. The literature points to a list that's called the dirty dozen, right, that have been found to be most commonly related to errors in other complex high-risk industries. Although originally developed for aircraft maintenance group, the list seems readily transferable to the context of forensic science. So as we go through this list, you could imagine that um, these types of things cause pressure and stress and might put people in the danger zone for, uh, for committing an error. Oftentimes there are more than one of these working together to create a really large hole in that Swiss cheese, um, a set of Swiss cheese. Uh, and that allows an error to occur. And of course this list is just 12. Um, it's not a comprehensive list, um, and it's sometimes expanded to what they call the filthy 15, right? They add three additional ones to it. Um, and uh, the list is, some, like I said, is sometimes expanded and referred to as the, fif the filthy 15 when you add not admitting your limitations, you add a lack of operational integrity and a lack of professionalism. And you think about those lists, that filthy 15 and all of those items, doesn't it sound familiar? It comes, it sounds like a lot of the critiques that is placed on forensic science. And here are some other key takeaways from the human factors literature um, in other complex <coughs> fields. The first thing is that we have to acknowledge that errors occur in all human endeavors, right? I'll just let that sit for a minute, right? People make mistakes. It's, it seems simple on its face, but um, when you're in a high-risk industry like forensic science or aviation, you don't want to accept that, right? Because the risk of an error is uh, so problematic. Uh, some errors can be prevented by designing tasks and processes that minimize dependencies on weak cognitive skills, like memory, right? So if you were to create a process that requires someone to memorize something and not write it down, and you have to have them recall it two years from now, um, far away from when they'd done the work and they didn't write any notes, um, they're probably not going to memorize it. They're not going to remember it. They're not going to be able to recall it because that's a uh, um, weak cognitive function. This idea that drift happens, that over time, as you become an expert and you um, understand the process more fully, you know where you can take shortcuts. And eventually, you may start taking short, more and more shortcuts that lead you in a danger zone, right, where you're not as um, vigilant as you were when you were um, uh, first trained. Error reporting is a critical aspect of any quality management system. And fear of punishment inhibits error reporting. Right? This is simple. If you punish people, they're not going to be willing to come forward when an error does happen. Um, and that a systems approach offers a critical way to assess issues within the system and identify areas for improvement. So about, I guess it's about 10 years now, um, I moved from the National Institute of Justice to, uh, to NIST, and one of the projects that I started up when I first went to NIST was this idea of pulling together an expert working group series on human factors, where we would bring together people who traditionally wouldn't sit at the table um, to discuss uh, this, this uh, sort of outside area of human factors and try to gain a better understanding of how those principles could be applied in a forensic setting. So this working group series was charged with gaining a better understanding of, of um, human factors in forensic sciences. We did one in latent prints, and here to, we're here to talk about the one in handwriting examination uh, today. Um, so I asked them to, one, 
figure out what is it that a handwriting examiner does, right? So we started off with creating a process map that was descriptive of current practice. And then we looked at what are the impacts of human factors issues like the dirty dozen and make recommendations to reduce the likelihood and impact of error in that field. So the big question that we were asking the working group was what are uh, the things that prevent an examiner from excellence, right? So the expert working group series um, starts out by examining current uh, policies, procedures, and practices within the field of forensic handwriting examination. They develop recommendations based on scientifically sound research uh, to reduce the likelihood of errors. They evaluate various approaches to quantifying measurement uncertainty in the area of handwriting. And then we were supposed to publish our findings. I would had hoped that it would be published by um, before this meeting, but we're still in the final stages of the review process. So that's coming soon. So to tell you a little bit about who's on the working group, right? So uh, members are selected based on uh, demonstrated and recognized expertise in forensic sciences or a related field of work. Um, they're selected because of their ability to balance scientific rigor with practical and regulatory constraints and their ability to work um, as a member of the team. And that is very important because these are very um, high stakes conversations and people come in with, uh, with their own positions and um, their own interests and it's, it's sometimes difficult to reach consensus when you're talking about stuff that really matters. Uh, so the working group included forensic scientists, statisticians, psychologists, researchers, and individuals from the legal, legal community. We also had professional uh, organization representation and other identified stakeholders. Throughout the process, we brought in um, other people to do workshops um, uh, based on their special knowledge or expertise in different areas that the working group really wanted to better understand. So we really did try to look at this um, uh, look at this uh, this area um, with a comprehensive lens through a comprehensive lens. So this is a bit of an eye chart, but you can see that um, we had lots of representation. There were 24 members on the working group, in addition to um, three people who uh, who attended the meetings um, and provided uh, significant feedback on the report. So this is some uh, demographics about the working group. So we had uh, 24 working group members. I say 23 plus one because um, Dana was not a voting member, but she came vigilantly to every meeting and participated. Uh, we had 14 examiners on uh, the working group, and four were in private practice. Uh, 17 were US-based, seven were international. We had five non-forensic scientists, uh, six professors, six, uh, three statisticians, uh, two legal scholars, uh, five of them were employed by U.S. government agencies, and the breakdown of men and women were 18 uh, to 6. So a brief look at how we worked. Um, this is what it looked like sometimes, minus the dirt. <laughs> All right, so we spent a great deal of time um, broken out into subgroups for portions of the process. We refined ideas and recommendations in those subgroups, and then we presented it to the full group. It's, I, and let me just remind you, it's 24 people that are coming from lots of differing perspectives, right? And I hope that by the end, when you see these recommendations, that, um, that you're impressed because it is a difficult task to get 24 people to agree to um, words on a page and concepts, right? Uh, so the material developed by the subgroups then became individual chapters and sections of the final report. The subgroups were broken down into um, these categories. We had one group that was responsible for looking at interpretation and technology, reporting and testimony, quality assurance, quality control, education and training, uh, management, and work environment. We also had a process mapping group. So this is the process map from the latent fingerprint report. Um, and we're actually, OSAC is actually redoing this process map. And um, if you think that this looks complicated, when you see their 11 page process map, you can see that <laughs> it gets really complex really fast. But before you can try to fix something, you have to know what's going on, right? So um, 
I literally sometimes locked uh, a group of seven people in a room and just asked them, what do you do next? What do you do next? Why, why, why? And what information do you have available to you at the time? What's the input for that decision? What's the output for that decision? How do you get to um, making a conclusion uh, in an area? So like I said, one of the first tasks is developing a common understanding of the task. Uh, we do this by developing a generalized process map. The process map is intended to be descriptive, not prescriptive, right? It is, it is describing what current practice is. We're not telling people or endorsing uh, a, a process here. We just want to be able to understand the task. Um, and because it's a multidisciplinary group, uh, many people on the group weren't familiar with the way handwriting examinations were concluded. So um, the process map becomes very important not only to uh, people on the outside who are reading the report, but it also is critical to members of the working group. And the process map that you saw earlier for latent print um, uh, that shows up in the latent print report uh, has been translated into four languages. It's been incorporated into SWIGFAST standards, used in training modules through, um, by agencies throughout the world. So it's become you know, a really impactful tool, not just for the working group, but like I said, for the community at large. So again, why is it important to document the process, not just for our purpose, but in the field in general? Right? The identification of how a process or current system operates is an essential element in identifying improvement opportunities. It raises visibility in uh, process issues. As we go through the process, you can go and say box number three. Hey, there's always an input deficiency in that box. Let's see what we can do to make that better. It improves the baseline from which we measure uh, productivity and improvements. It captures knowledge so that we can train others. It reduces the hidden factory and documents how the work really gets done. So if you think about how people describe, um, how you would describe going to the grocery store, for example, I would imagine that you would leave off a few steps, right? You'd probably forget to say, I'm gonna make a list, or that I'm gonna open the door and close the door, that when people are describing their process, they often leave things off. So having um, this process mapping exercise makes sure that we capture everything um, that's being done. It reduces the hidden factory um, and documents, like I said, how, how the work is, is, uh, is really done. It eliminates working by folklore, right? So when you have a process map, you know why you're doing something and you're not just doing it because that's what my trainer told me to do. Um, and it aids in a culture shift from who made the error to what allowed this error to occur, right? You can look at the process as a whole and move away from that person approach of error analysis to a systems approach. And like I said, before you can improve a process, you have to understand it. So as I said, this is a second report in the working group series, and um, they both took about two and a half years. It takes a long time to generate consensus on, on um, these important uh, topics. Uh, but this report, once it comes out, it's gonna offer a comprehensive discussion of how human factors relate to all aspects of handwriting examination, including communicating conclusions through reports and testimony. Um, this process was a huge effort and success is a, truly a testimony, uh, testament to the dedication of the working group members. They showed up, they came prepared to discuss, and they worked through um, what otherwise uh, could have been uh, very, very difficult topics. So there's a huge disclaimer on the report that shouldn't be overlooked and that the opinions and the views expressed in that report are not that <laughs> of NIST or DOJ or any of the sponsors. It is a reflection of the working group and their understanding of the process and what they think um, uh, they want to recommend uh, to the field for improvement. So I encourage you when the report comes out to don't just race to the recommendations, right? Read the text, right? Because the text, um, the recommendations are important, but the full text really discusses, you know, and tries to capture the extensive in-depth conversations uh, that the working group engaged in over time. So my final thoughts, read the report, both the latent print examination report and when this report is published, um, the handwriting. Um, volunteer if you're interested in this type, having these types of discussions. There are two additional working groups that are starting up in this series. One focused on DNA mixture interpretation that's going to uh, start uh, at the end of the summer, early fall, and uh, one on firearms and tool marks, and that'll start in late 2018.
And uh, my final thought is just to remember that we can't stop people from being human, uh, but we can change the conditions under which they work um, by building systems with checks and balances. Thank you. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about the process map a little more in depth to provide a little bit of an insight as to what we do as document examiners because that's the perspective that I'm going to share. So I can understand that this is probably extremely hard to read because the, uh, the font is so small. Um, and this is just an excerpt, again, from this process map that will be produced uh, in this document. So you may need to get your magnifying glass out to, to read some of these boxes. But as Melissa mentioned, it was very important to walk through this, not only from the perspective of uh, relaying what's going on, uh, the thought processes behind what the document examiner is doing or the handwriting expert, so that everybody was on the same page. But also, this was a key component to start identifying potential uh, problems or holes in, in what we do. So I'm just gonna kind of walk through this. And it starts with, um, on, on the left-hand side, you see a little arrow coming in, and it talks about case acceptance of the laboratory's policy as they receive the case, what goes into that. But jumping into the question writing pre-analysis, um, ultimately you receive these documents, and the question is, uh, what do you have? So you separate your question writing from your known writing. And then you um, may break it down by writing style, whether that's cursive writing, whether you have uh, signature components, whether you have hand printing. So you, you might start to separate um, these documents out. And does, then, we, then we often ask ourselves the question of, does the um, question writing, are these original documents? Because there's much more information available to us if we have the original documents. If they are not there, uh, ultimately we request those and, and try to obtain those. For whatever reason, sometimes the investigator uh, or the individual hangs on to the original because they're worried that the document examiner is going to do something to this evidence. So sometimes uh, we, it is available and we're ultimately able to look at that. Then, then we start to assess um, whether or not there is sufficient clarity and detail in these documents to do something with. Sometimes you may have a limited examination and you're not able to do anything with the information that you have and you ultimately report that out. Um, you may need to do some processing of that to clarify, to, to enhance, to bring out the information in the document to make it more visible or apparent. Um, then across the top there, box 170, um, you start to look at uh, the character set. Is it something that you're used to seeing or is it a, is it a foreign writing script? Um, and if you need additional information, consider consulting the submitter or the person that you're working with and, and get some um, case relevant or task relevant information. Um, then ultimately you will um, start to compare and look and do your analysis of the question writing. So at this point, you're starting to consider and make observations about uh, characteristics present in the question writing, uh, the, the complexity of the writing, um, the type of document that you have, writing instruments used, and the writing appearance, whether it's natural or distorted. Uh, if you have multiple questioned document samples, uh, you work through those, you might work them in a group if you had grouped them together, or you may uh, keep them separate depending upon the, um, the conditions in there. Um, then you, as I said, you, make, you, you work through your observations and record your observations. Then ultimately, you do a similar process with the known documents. There may be some subtle differences in there, uh, and I won't, I won't walk through that with you. After you have analyzed these uh, questioned and known samples, you start to do your, your comparison. You look for those observations that you um, made note of and you start to um, evaluate or you start to go through the similarities and differences and walk through um, things that may be absent, additional information that you need that's not available in that comparison. 
And ultimately, it leads you to the evaluation stage, which will give you your conclusion. Um, so here, you're evaluating the construction of the, the characteristics, uh, both similarities and differences, and you're determining whether the significance of those, uh, those feature sets. And you start walking through um, and asking yourself, does the, the compared writing contain sufficient amount of information, and is it representative of the known writer? Uh, is there additional information in there? Could it be manipulated? Could it be a cut and paste? Um, could there be um, other sorts of conditions that impact uh, the examination? Um, and if it's free of distortion and unexplained differences, um, then we can start proceeding down to our conclusions, which are on the far right side. And um, generally speaking, we would end up with a conclusion. Now here in this, this slide, uh, on the left-hand side, it gives an example of the traditional conclusion scales that a document examiner would reach. Um, the far left one, column A, uh, conclusions often required in studies where they generally break it down to uh, three decisions, an identification, inconclusive, or elimination. In, when uh, examiners work proficiency tests provided by CTS, they're often asked to break it down into five uh, opinions. And that's column B. Was written by, was probably written by, cannot identify or eliminate, was probably not written by, was written by. The FBI uses a slightly different five-point scale, and that's column C. Column D is a, a seven-point um, scale, and ultimately you're starting to, to slice the bologna a little thinner. Um, and then most examiners and um, those that use ASTM or SWIGDOC standards use a nine-point scale. And there we, we slice the bologna a little thinner yet. Uh, which you have your identification, so your, your definitive conclusion, followed by um, some qualified conclusions in the middle, talking about strong probability, highly probable, very probable, um, to a probable. Uh, then you would have a, a weaker qualified conclusion, so it may be something like, uh, though Brett Bishop cannot be identified or excluded as the writer, there are indications uh, that he wrote the question document. Uh, in the middle, we have our inconclusive still, and then you have the same conclusions on the, the other side. Um, there was discussion too, uh, as Melissa said, we had international perspectives in the group. And on the far right side, you have, um, was broken down by the um, European Network of Forensic Handwriting uh, that group, the ENFSE, uh, the, their verbal likelihood scale. And you can see they have a few more categories there, uh, but they start going to the direction of um, the support of the evidence. And that's where this modular approach in the middle is where the group ultimately um, has, has ended up. Um, I want to say that the document examiners have recognized for quite a while now that their conclusions may not be, uh, the traditional nine point scale may not be the best way of conveying uh, the message. And we have recognized that and wanted to make some changes. When um, NIST and OSAC came together, there was this idea that um, not only did we want to change, but I think many of the other impression pattern disciplines wanted to change the way they were doing. And we had this um, single, well, th we had this moment where uh, there was this chance of a unicorn rumor of making an appearance where all the impression pattern disciplines were going to have similar using the same conclusions mm -hmm. and um, we would kind of be speaking the same language. But that, that unicorn has disappeared mm -hmm. into the ether and so each of the disciplines are starting to, are going to continue defining their own um, but this is the direction that the working group is recommending that we go. And I believe ultimately uh, the question document subcommittee is, is going in a direction like this. We're not there yet. Uh, it will take some time. Um, 
but it's going this modular approach where if we're talking a little more in the, the likelihood ratio language, if you will, from a, a non-statistician's perspective. Um, and the, the strongest conclusion may say something along the lines of the evidence provides support, very strong support for um, the proposition. And, and something that we, we talked about in this, this working group was that it will be important to explicitly state the uh, propositions of the examination. Um, so this is, this is looking like a five-point scale, um, and it may be divided up slightly more. Who knows? We'll see where it ends up. But this was the recommendation of the working group. Something else that came up when we were um, going through this whole process was the, the initial claims um, or the foundational claims of, of document examination. And I'll talk about those two right here. Uh, the first one being the principle um, of indiv individuality that no two writers share the same combination of handwriting characteristics given sufficient quantity and quality of writing to compare. The recommendation coming out of that, there's, and keep in mind, as, as Melissa stated, is very important to not just read the recommendations in this document, but to read the, the narrative because uh, it provides a lot of context as to how we got to these recommendations, um, both from, from multiple perspectives. So the recommendation coming out of this for those that are, that are still doing this, um, that document examiners must not report or testify directly or by implication that the question handwriting has been written by an individual to the exclusion of all others. And there's that paragraph in the middle uh, this is a quote from the document where it's talking more about um, in the view the individuality is defined with respect to the probability of, of observing writing profiles of two individuals that are is indistinguishable using the spe specified comparison method. So that was one of the topics uh, that is addressed in there. The second principle is that no two writings by the same person are identical. And in, in this comment here, again, this is also a quote from the document where it talks about that it's not just a matter of, of the intra and inter writing variation and importance of those arguments, but they actually have a deeper a root in motor control theory. And, um, and ultimately that can steer the, um, the group and, and research needs as to addressing uh, some of these concerns which leads to some of the research needs that are coming out of this document. Um, there's the recommendation there that the research community work with FDEs and they should investigate um, a little bit about bias and the impact that it would have on um, what sort of information the document examiner has and how to balance that bias and, and potential loss of information of how that can affect the exam. Um, another recommendation is that FDEs should work with researchers to design black box studies that studies the bias, reproducibility, repeatability, and the interpretation and conclusions. Um, I know that the FBI is currently working on one, and um, so that's a step in that direction. Additional research needs um, are publicly available databases of handwriting. Um, with these, a lot of studies can come out of it. You're all, we're all, the research would all be based off the same set. Um, and the important part about that would be um, evaluating some of these characteristics uh, by geographical areas. As the as, um, United States is a very diverse uh, uh, area, um, you have different populations groups, you have people from uh, learning all kinds of different writing styles and uh, some of those things don't hold true anymore, especially if they're not even teaching handwriting in schools. Um, so it's also a matter of whether or not these, how often these um, features occur and the identification of rarely occurring features so we can uh, add some weight to that. Um, some of these characteristics and how they're associated with subgroups, whether they're class characteristics or um, 
the significance of those characteristics. So those are a few of the things that are important that could come out of these databases. Something else that the working group says or discuss that we need additional research on is writing complexity. Um, when you have varying writing complexity from very complex writing to very simplistic writing, um, how much is enough and, and what does it take to quantify that to evaluate and come to those decisions? Uh, in developing methods to quantify uh, those differences between inner writer and intra writer and the, the variability there. The amount of writing required to reach a conclusion uh, about the writership of, of question documents, that's a very important discussion. Uh, sometimes, depending upon the significance of the writing, you can reach a conclusion with very little uh, writing um, if, if you have some highly stylized characteristics. But if they're very simplistic characteristics, um, you may not be able to do anything with that even if you have a large amount of writing. So uh, those were some important aspects as well. Um, this was kind of an interesting uh, recommendation and I think it goes to the heart of the working group where the document examiners in the room or in the group recognize that the, the discipline is far from perfect. And uh, I think this was a very important recommendation that um, the FD community should generate a comprehensive list of claims made by the examiners that, and then conduct empirical studies in collaboration with the research community to characterize the extent of scientific support for those claims. So there may be aspects that we claim that we can do that we can't do very well. And I think it's important to, to study that and, and look at those things. And there may be things in there um, that we should not be doing anymore. And ultimately, I think these, um, these would be great things to explore. And I think it's very um, progressive of the group um, and bold for them to, to make this statement. So I think it goes to show the, the heart of the group that they ultimately want what's best uh, for the criminal justice community. And we don't want things to be overstated, but yet we still feel we have a very valuable uh, service and skill that we can, we can provide to the criminal justice system. Another aspect that was discussed um, was quality assurance and quality control. And this is something that was uh, a contentious topic. Um, one of the recommendations here was that um, bottom line, if you are a handwriting expert, you should have some sort of quality assurance, quality control system. And uh, there's discussions in there about what that means. For those that work in an accredited lab, they're fully aware of what that means. Because as they go through that ISO uh, accreditation, they understand some of those components. And this was um, something that the ABA uh, recommended back in 2006, that crime laboratories and medical examiner offices should be accredited, examiners should be certified, and procedures should be standardized and published to ensure the validity, reliability, and timely analysis of forensic evidence. My understanding is that crime, most crime labs are accredited. Uh, there's also a recommendation here that all uh, examiners be certified. And by certification, certified by an accredited, um, a certifying body that is accredited to ISO 17024, I believe is, is the recommendation. And so that is also an important aspect. Um, but the accreditation what, the reason why it was contentious is because there were examiners from the private sector that say that this is a very onerous and, and restrictive process. It's not an easy thing to do. But I think what, is, what those who work in accredited lab want to emphasize the point that the, the accreditation provides um, a valuable perspective in that you have outside people coming in and looking at your system to see if you are doing what you say you're doing. So you have an extra set of eyes uh, evaluating your system and you're also following um, some standardized procedures, standardized um, protocols. So I think that's a very important aspect. Um, but again, it was very contentious because it's, it's not something that would be easy for um, examiners to do. I want to go back here real quick. Something that a lot of labs do 
um, as part of quality control is this case review uh, prior to the finalized report that comes out, where that case, uh, once the examiner has completed that case, it's um, usually reviewed or technically reviewed by another colleague. So they're going through the and examining the case to determine if the standards were followed, if uh, protocols, procedures were followed, if there are any uh, mistakes, and then also uh, did the examiner come to the right conclusion when they evaluated the evidence. So I want to say those that work uh, in accredited lab do have some sort of, of, of review process and that's very important uh, to minimizing some of these human factors. I'm not saying that accreditation is, is the stamp that, that makes everything perfect because um, you, you can still do these things on your own and still have these review, but it's just another perspective in there uh, that it offers a valuable service. So those are just a few of the, few of the snippets from the, the, um, this document that will be coming out soon uh, from a document examiner's perspective. <clears throat> we'll stay there. There may be some questions, and if not, oh, we have some over here. Yes. Me? Yep. Yeah. And then uh, Sarah. Thank you. This is Alicia Garriki. Thank you so much for the talk. It was really um, very interesting, and I look forward to reading the report. Um, a question for you is, did you, did the committee take into account any of the automated systems like Dash ID and yes. so on? Yes. Yeah, that was, that was discussed too, and I didn't put it in the presentation, but yeah, there, there's a section in there that talks about um, the advantages and disadvantages of some of the systems, where they've been in the past, and, and some potential um, things to look for in the future. Okay, thank you. And, and some of the researchers in those uh, programs were in the committee. Ah, uh, okay. So we, we discussed them. Okay. Sarah, is that Sarah? <coughs> um, thanks. I, I wanted to ask, with regard to the case review component of the quality control yes. section, um, consequently, if um, if this is the process that's recommended, did the um, committee come out with a recommendation for a minimum number of examiners that would be required in a unit or um, within some sort of collaborative in order to implement this? Yeah, I believe there were I believe there were different, I don't think there's necessarily strictly a recommendation that states that, but that was discussed, talking about, I know in the, the management section, talking about having a section that's viable, so at least, for example, three, so you can rotate that around so you don't have, um, you know, a one-to-one -a, -a -one, a relationship where you're just exchanging cases. So, Partnering in it either via network or whether your lab system is set up that way. So there was a discussion about that and, and how that would be beneficial. And that was one of the issues with respect to the private examiners because they don't have anybody else uh, in their, their laboratory to do these uh, reviews. So we talked about ways in which they could network with other private examiners or with laboratories to, so that there is a, an exchange of a review. I, I believe there are there, yes. Because we, we have, the, the report has broken out in some fashion. I'm not sure how it will be broken out in the end. But uh, topics or, or suggestions with respect specifically to private examiners, because they, they, they do have other challenges uh, that a public laboratory may not have. And, and in that example, I know that one of the recommendations implicitly um, states it because it talks about being accredited to or having a quality control system that would be in a line with uh, ISO standards even if you're not accredited and if you're doing that then there would be a component of review in that. Yes sir, we'll get here. Uh, from a document examiner's perspective, what would you consider to be case relevant information? Um, <coughs> I would say in generally things that would uh, affect the right. So for example, one thing that was heavily discussed here was maybe implementing some sort of uh, case management or um, system where an individual 
receives all the information from the investigator and way too much information and that they would extract out uh, the relevant information to um, the document examiner and provide that information leaving out uh, everything else. So what kinds of studies? Could you give us some examples? Uh, so for example, if, if there are any medications uh, used by the writer, maybe the age, uh, maybe um, some things along the lines of contemporaneousness, if we know when these documents were created, uh, if they're representative of the known writing sample, some things like that. But a more difficult question was how do you reduce the cognitive bias as a result of the content of the writing, which may, in and of itself, you know, in a, in a kidnapping case, a kidnapping of a two-year-old or something like that, or the gruesome dismemberment of a body uh, that happened to be reduced to writing, there's going to be a certain amount of bias built into that because of the nature of the crime. And there were suggestions such as, well, you extract out all that bad stuff, but then you're extracting out data as well. So it, that's just part of the life of a document examiner to be able to work with that type of um, cognitive bias. Um, hi. Um, my name is Andy Solmer. I'm a forensic document examiner of the law attorney. Um, I wanted to make a point with respect to what you just said, Ken. One of the, yeah, one of the, with respect to what you just said, and then I have two questions. Um, with respect to the problems associated with, let's say, the content of the writing, to the extent you have exemplar lineups, meaning you're submitted known writings of more than just one individual, several individuals, that reduces the significance of the content because you still don't know or have an idea of who the suspect writer is. That's number one. Number two, the uh, point I wanted to ask was, with respect to the opinion language, I saw the five levels and I saw the, um, I forget what it is, uh, uh, strong support and it was, the, yeah, thank you, yeah. qualified support. Mm -hmm. So um, I've written and I've expressed concerns about the qualified support part of this. And so under the nine level scale that was originally used, they had, um, there's indications that somebody wrote something, uh, probably wrote something, than highly probable. And as both a document examiner and an attorney, I'm very concerned about the use of opinions that say indications. What is the really true probative value of such an opinion? And should such an opinion, if it's really indications or probable, is it appropriate for that kind of a, with, of an opinion with that kind of a level of certitude to be testified? Or is it more appropriate to limit an opinion with that level of certitude to an investigative report to give investigators leads or follow-up uh, 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 studies or, or you know more investigations as possible writers. Um, so I'd like to know how that's being dealt with or if it's been dealt with. And then um, the other thing about case reviews, uh, I think Blake Sarah asked the question. Um, there are three different types of case reviews. Um, ASCLAD lab, which had standards for that. Um, there is an administrative review, which is kind of like a spell check. There is a technical review, where the reviewer looks at the documentation, not at the evidence, but at the documentation, the report, possibly some notes, to see if the documentation, at least on a um, facial basis, supports the opinion that's expressed. That's not an independent evaluation of the evidence that led to that conclusion. The third type of review is a verification. And that is an independent review of the evidence, completely by a second party that doesn't know, A, should, preferably shouldn't know what the first examiner was, and shouldn't know what the first examiner's conclusion was. Generally, in a law enforcement setting, you see mainly technical you don't really see that many verifications where there's a totally, you know, independent review of the evidence by somebody that doesn't know A, that the first guy even looked at, let alone what he concluded. My question is, have you addressed that issue and are you making any recommendation <coughs> on the type of reviews? Really, like, for example, that if you're going to have reviews, should it be a verification? And should it be a blind verification? 
I, I believe regarding that last one regarding review, yes, I believe those uh, different types of review are discussed. And I believe that, that there might even be a recommendation to study the benefits, uh, the pros and cons of that, whether whether or not there needs to be a blind, whether or not it needs to be double blind, whether, uh, so I think it evaluate, I think there's some discussion on there to um, consider that and ultimately that yes, that should be explored because, um, yeah. And there is a significant discussion of that in the report um, by the working group, in particular that um, people call technical review and verification by many different names. So someone may say, I'm doing a technical review, but really they're looking at, um, really talking about uh, administrative review or verification. So we do spend a lot of time picking apart those uh, terms and then making recommendations about um, how best to go about it, in addition to reflecting what's in the literature about that. And that's a really important um, uh, thing to note, that we weren't just relying on the members of the working group and their opinions on the topic. We really did go the, uh, go the extra mile and look to the literature to say, what are people saying about Andy, this? Andy, let me take one of the lawyers. Let me take one with the, with the opinion language. The lawyers on the committee. With the opinion language or the appropriateness of low-level certitude and opinions, David is going to address that. Yeah. So that when she gets okay. to hers and, and next, Thank you. Uh, we don't want to cut her short on time. Okay. We have one question over here. Um, I'm not a document examiner, but I was just curious about the other aspects of document examination, like the analysis of paper and all that. Is that being handled somewhere else? Yeah, that wasn't discussed in this document. We we're only specifically talking about handwriting. For the scope of this document. That, that was something that kept coming up and the document examiners in the room wanted to uh, reach out into some of those areas, but uh, Melissa kept reining us in and said, no, we're only talking about handwriting examination. But is it being handled by some other OSAC group or something? Um, OSAC is looking at all aspects of forensic document examination, but this, the scope of this document was held to just handwriting because the human factors issues that affect those other aspects would be different. So, um, and this could be easily done. I did crack the whip on that one. But currently, it is not in this human factors and other document examination aspects. No, I'm just one person. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you do it, but you do it. Dana, do you want to take over? Thank you. point about the automated systems. So handwriting analysis is certainly a, a field in which there are a lot of automated systems that have been used in different kinds of contexts, the Postal Service and others, and there's a lot of very promising research in those areas. I think it's really important that when we're talking about forensics in court, though, that we distinguish between promising technologies that we use in other contexts and what's actually being done in court. So those automated techniques can teach us a lot. They can tell us something really important, which is that there is probably signal in the noise of handwriting because they work. And so they're telling us there's really information here that can be valuable. What they don't tell us is what does a human examiner who's looking at it in a totally different way, using a totally different method, is he getting it right or is he getting it wrong in different kinds of tasks? So it's just important that we don't conflate the promise of automated techniques that aren't being used in court with what, what's actually being used. And there really isn't a reason to do that because as, as we know, there, there's some body of research supporting at least some of the claims that handwriting examiners make. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the reporting and testimony aspect of the report, which was a major piece of you know, a very long document covering a lot of areas. And I wanna start by talking over some of the big issues that we dealt with in this chapter. So some of our key themes, I think the most important is transparency. You can probably get the impression from the previous speakers that there was a lot of debate and discussion in our working group and many areas about which people did not agree. What we were able to do, and I think part of the major goal of the reporting and testimony chapter was to say, in places in which we didn't agree about a particular recommendation, uh, say for example, linear or sequential unmasking, or the order in which a document examiner looks at question versus known documents, at a minimum we were able to say whether or not we can recommend that something be done in a particular way, that how it was done 
and the human factors effects, particularly in relationship to cognitive bias, be disclosed. So we had a very strong focus on transparency, making sure that everything the document examiner did and didn't do is disclosed. As you heard from Brett, we also spent a lot of time in thinking about validity, reliability, and objectivity. I'll get to this in a little bit. It's sort of complicated to talk about reporting and testimony at the same time as the rest of the working group is working on what exactly underlies that reporting and testimony, but it was something that really animated our discussions from the beginning. We also focused significantly on the report as opposed to testimony, and that's for a number of obvious reasons. Most pressingly, there's a very low trial rate in criminal cases and also a very low trial rate in, in civil matters, which many forensic examiners on the private practice side also engage in. We also focus not just on the human factors that affect our expert, our handwriting examiner, but the human factors that relate to the ultimate user or receiver of the report or testimony. So this document doesn't go out into a vacuum. The testimony isn't given into the ether. Lawyers, judges, fact finders, police officers, investigators all take in this information, and they bring their whole set of human factors to the report and testimony that they receive as well. These are um, extremely complicated issues that our working group can't solve, but we did spend a lot of time, and I think put a lot of energy into reading the research and trying to understand how the work that our examiners are doing, the examiners in our group and others, is received by people who take in that information. So I think this is the overarching recommendation in our chapter. I happen to just think that it really, it's not delineated in any special way. But this recommendation, I think, captures the essence of what the reporting and testimony chapter says, which is that handwriting examiners must testify in a nonpartisan manner, answer all questions from counsel and the court directly, accurately, and fully, provide appropriate information before, during, and after trial, and that all opinions must be supported by sufficient data. This uh, recommendation is very similar to a recommendation made in the latent print group. On its face, it doesn't seem very controversial, but it's actually telling examiners something, some really important things that many forensic scientists don't fully understand or incorporate into their practice. Uh, we're gonna go back to the after trial part in a minute, but this recommendation really animates the rest of the, this chapter. So the duty to correct, so this is the after trial piece. This is a very significant recommendation that I think came out of the working group which is that an examiner must take steps after trial, not just once a trial is over, once a report is issued or a case has settled or pleaded guilty, to make sure the information he or she has conveyed is scientifically appropriate and has been conveyed in an appropriate manner. That obligation to communicate scientifically appropriate information doesn't just end. The examiner doesn't write his report and it's over. In fact, later on, if he or she learns that perhaps something he has said or done wasn't actually based on sound science. Maybe our understanding of handwriting has changed. Maybe we now know that a technique that we engaged in really doesn't work the way we thought it did, or we might have gotten something wrong. It might simply be a mistake that doesn't relate to the soundness at all, just a human error. But then maybe there was some other otherwise incompetent practice. You know, we can, we'll talk about assumptions in a minute, but handwriting examiners base um, some of their examinations on certain assumptions that they have to make. That's communicated to a fact finder, but maybe that assumption the examiner learns later has changed, that what he assumed to be true wasn't, and that could have a meaningful impact on his report. We've made a strong recommendation in the working group in this chapter and in the quality assurance chapter that examiners have an obligation, an ethical obligation to correct these sorts of mistakes. It's complicated, right? This isn't like the FBI hair audit where you have one body that has a very clear, um, well, complicated in that context, also identifying the cases, but handwriting is an extremely diverse group. Uh, forensic document examiners are in private labs, they're in government, they're solo practitioners, there are a ton of professional societies and bodies to which people belong. So you're talking about an extremely diverse and diffuse group of people. So telling this group of people you have to make, you have to undertake this huge obligation to correct errors in your testimony or problems that you find out about later, 10, 20 years after trial is hard, and it was not 
the subject of small discussion in our group, but I think people ultimately understood that if, for this work to have value and meaning and to prevent miscarriages of justice, you absolutely have an obligation and a duty to, to correct. And that duty is reflected in many, you know, reflected in many professional bodies already. It's reflected to some extent in AskCloud Lab, in the NCFS recommendations. And so we've made, in addition to the general recommendation for duty to correct, recommended that professional societies, handwriting examiners, explicitly make this a part of their code of conduct. Uh, all of them have a code of conduct the, delineating the ethics of their members. And that once they've done that, that they undertake the role of helping examiners, particularly those in private practice who may not have a reporting chain that's very clear or easy to follow, um, to help people really fulfill this duty. So we just heard a little bit about this, but another major piece of this report and the reporting and testimony chapter deals with the opinion scales. So we saw this opinion scale a minute ago, and it just focus on the left-hand side. Historically, handwriting examiners have testified, you know, some sort of point or scale-based variation on an identification, an inconclusive, and an exclusion, uh, with some room for probabilities. A major contribution of this report is, I think, is acknowledging the problems with these scales. Um, what does it mean to say something is highly probable versus probable, right? What does it mean if we're going to say something, you know, probably did right or indications did right? There's not a lot of empirical evidence distinguishing between those things, right? So we have a couple of problems here, and one is that. One is that there isn't empirical evidence to which we can peg probably wrote or indications did right. We also don't know what that means because it is not tied to empirical evidence that we have out in the real world. We also don't know what examiners themselves mean when they say that. When Brett says that probably did right, that could mean something very different than the next examiner, even in his own lab, who says that. You add on to that the fact that once we're sort of divorced from empirical data, we don't know what the listener means. Well, when the jury hears probably did right, what do they understand that to mean? Yeah, the working group spent a lot of time digging into the research on jury understandings of different kinds of terminology and phrases. Unfortunately, that research isn't nearly as robust as we would like it to be, but we know that juries and fact finders take in information in all kinds of ways that we don't really want them to, that don't really reflect what we think or forensic examiners think the value of the evidence is. There's also, as we know, you know, this is a lot of different ways to say the same thing. If you're a lawyer, you know, as Ken and I like to argue about, depending on where, you know, what the evidence looks like, you may want, you might prefer somebody who has a, who's using the scale at the left versus the right. That really shouldn't be how scientific evidence is communicated. It shouldn't matter whether somebody comes from this lab or that lab if they're going to give evidence that my jury, hearing the same evidence, would understand to be much stronger or much less strong. It should be the same. So the report has made a very strong recommendation to move to likelihood ratios. Uh, I'm going to speak for myself and not the working group here when I say I think there's some good and some bad that comes out of that. I mean, the bad is that it's still not empirically validated. We can move to likelihood ratios all we want, but that doesn't actually change our problem, and I'll get to that in a second. The good, and I think the report comes down very strongly on this as well, is that there's a strong recommendation that we do black box studies with ground truth known samples, and that we use those to build consensus, basically consensus-based answers, so we know, you know, when examiners say highly probable, or I don't have the, the correct the scale that we're using. If they say, you know, evidence provides very strong support, are they agreeing? Are they saying the same thing when they're looking at the same kind of evidence? There's a lot of difficulty in this, uh, even setting aside the sort of legal difficulties, especially from the defense side. This is a really, as I said, a diverse group of practitioners. Likelihood ratios are hard to understand. They're complicated. Uh, Statisticians like to disagree because I think it's very intuitive to people who have PhDs in math, but not to the rest of us. And I think many handwriting examiners, particularly those that weren't trained and don't have the support of big labs, will have a hard, may have a hard time moving to this kind of system. It's a radically different way of communicating evidence and understanding what that evidence means. The biggest problem, though, from my perspective, 
is that we're maybe putting the cart before the horse a little bit. You know, we spent a lot of time, and the forensic community at large, not just in handwriting, is spending a lot of time talking about the move to likelihood ratios. This is a lot of effort and energy talking about the way we communicate evidence without talking about, well, what underlies that? Repackaging the same information, which may have more or less scientific support, in a likelihood ratio doesn't really do, doesn't really move the ball, doesn't do much for us in terms of validity and reliability if the underlying science isn't there. Likelihood ratios have some advantages and disadvantages, which I think we're all gonna hear some about later today, but they can't solve a fundamental lack of data. So I have some concerns about putting the cart before the horse, partly in the context of this kind of working group and going back to Melissa was talking about it's a complex project where you have people writing about reporting and testimony at the same time you have people writing about scientific support. And so it's like you're trying to write about something that ideally, you know, ideally you'd write reporting and testimony at the end of once we know what the scientific support is, but it doesn't work that way. So some of this is a reflection of just what the working group was like. But I think it's also reflecting broader shifts in the forensic science community, which, in which we've all seen the push towards likelihood ratio. At the end of the day, I think the report still makes an effort to acknowledge the problems with this shift while trying to move practitioners towards a better practice. So those are the sort of high level things that animated much of this chapter. And we'll talk about some of the selected recommendations. So one of the recommendations that we made was to make pretrial disclosure between civil and criminal cases the same. Uh, one of the big advantages of working with practitioners who work in civil matters, which many, perhaps most forensic examiners don't, uh, is an understanding of what civil discovery rules are like and how much more robust they are. I have to say, I think this was a fairly non-controversial recommendation. I think our examiners are proud of the work they do and think that they're, they're doing it well. And understand that giving more disclosure to defense attorneys isn't backhanded or bad or harming their science. It's actually exposing it to scrutiny is a good thing. And that it really doesn't hurt anyone, it only makes the process better by having this kind of disclosure. This is also a recommendation that the National Commission on Forensic Science made. A recommendation that was somewhat more controversial was that examiners should write full reports. Now, it doesn't sound controversial when I frame it in these terms, but one of the issues that came up in our group is whether or not there was room uh, in the context of report writing to write abbreviated reports when there are emergent circumstances. I have to say, when I started this project, I had a really hard time imagining what an emergency handwriting analysis would look like. Um, you know, you just like, gotta get it done right now. But apparently it happens. Uh, sometimes, for example, one example that came up was in the context of uh, kidnapping notes. You might receive a ransom note and need to find out right away whether or not uh, a victim is still alive or not, you know, to modulate the police response. It was a complicated uh, recommendation to deal with because all of the other recommendations that we've made in our, con in our chapter on report writing and testimony, we make those recommendations because we think it makes the report and testimony better. We think it makes it more accurate, better, stronger, more valid, that people understand it better. You know, we're not just making the recommendations for fun, we think that they matter. And if they matter, shouldn't they matter in all, con in all contexts? Shouldn't it matter in this emergent circumstance? If they're so easy to throw away, do we need them at all? Are we making recommendations just for the sake of making them? I think we got to a point where our examiners who, particularly those who do these kinds of reports, and I should note not all agencies permit this. Many agencies reflected in our working group don't. But those who do engage in these kinds of reports felt that it was a practice that would continue. And so we spent some time thinking about, well, how could we make it you know, if we're gonna do this, how do we make it as good as it can be? Well, we encouraged and recommended that there was still documentation. So it can't just be a tossed off, you know, oral, you've got your guy, you don't. You have some documentation of what you've done. Most critically, and this goes back to the first slide about transparency, we recommended that the examiners understand that there was enhanced potential, enhanced potential for bias and also for reduced reliability. If they're doing this examination under quick, high pressure circumstances, that reduces reliability. There's a potential for that. And that this fact must be communicated to our reader or our listener. The investigator who's the recipient of this report has to understand that this is not the full report. This is not 
the way the examiner would ideally do this, this practice. And related to that is that if the examination ultimately ends up being used in court, uh, it's my understanding many of these cases sort of don't end up in a courtroom setting for all the reasons we've talked about plus others. But if it is to be the subject of testimony, that that examination be redone by someone else, a full re-examination, someone else who doesn't know the first result. So then we're actually not creating, trying to avoid or minimize the, the snowball effect. So for those of you who are familiar with Dr. E.T.L. Dora's work, we know that sort of bad information or biasing information at the beginning of investigation can snowball and you know, create more problems down the line. We can't really stop that you know, to the extent we engage in this, but we can reduce it by what I said, telling the recipient of the report about the potential for cognitive bias and for reduced reliability, and also ensuring that if it goes to a fact finder later, that that fact finder is getting a, a fresh set of eyes, somebody who hasn't had this initial glance at it. <coughs> we made a very, very lengthy, uh, and I think it's one of the big contributions of this report, recommendations about what needed to be in a report or case file, including some sample reports. Don't have time to talk about all of them, but a few notable ones are the disclosure of potential sources of error and their rates, and notably, if none, disclosing that fact. So if the rate of error for something isn't known, the report should disclose that. It should explicitly disclose any and all assumptions. I think to our handwriting examiners, the fact that assumptions are a part of practice is completely non-remarkable, and it, and it is. But many defense attorneys and prosecutors and judges who don't have familiarity with this technique aren't necessarily going to understand that when the handwriting examiner says, these are my known samples, that he's simply assuming that those examples came from the known source. And that may be a, a, a justified and appropriate assumption to make, but that fact has to be very clear to somebody who might not otherwise understand it. They also have to disclose all the propositions that were being considered. And this goes back to our shift to likelihood ratios. Then under a likelihood ratio approach, you're thinking about different explanations for the evidence. The report is now gonna disclose and the case file will make clear what are the different explanations that a, an expert considered. We also made a recommendation that the expert who did the examination is the person who testifies. I'm sure the lawyers and probably the forensic scientists in the room are aware the case law in this area is very complicated about whether or not there's actually a, the defendant has a constitutional right in the criminal context to have the examiner who actually did the report and the examination testify, or if so, what pieces of that. Um, the law used to be very clear, is now not so clear, but ultimately the working group felt that it was important, especially in a human factors context, that the person who did the examination be the person who testified. Because it's the person, you know, there are so many human factors that can go into handwriting analysis. Uh, it could be as simple as, you know, that handwriting analyst is having the worst week of his entire life. And when he goes in to do that examination, it's maybe not his best work. Maybe it is perfectly accurate, as Etail Dora makes clear, you know biasing problems, all these issues don't necessarily result in error. They just increase the risk of error. But it's very clear that many human factors that can affect a report are not gonna appear in the report itself. As much as we push towards transparency, they won't all appear in the report. And so it's really important that the person who actually did it is the person who's there. Because some other examiner isn't gonna know that Brett had a cold last week or in March 1995. I mean, maybe Brett won't know that either. That's another problem. But we felt very strongly that this should be the case. We made strong recommendations about error. So Brett talked about this a little bit. We have to acknowledge the possibility of error and discuss steps to reduce that error. One of the difficulties, or maybe not a difficulty in handwriting that Brett discussed is that the error rate is gonna be complex. You're not gonna have a single error rate in handwriting examination because there are a lot of different tasks. And there's lots of reasons to think the error rate is gonna be different. Examining signatures is different than examining large bodies of writing. Examining cursive is different than an analyzing handwriting. Uh, identifying something as a forgery is different than doing some other kind of comparison. And so what we really need to know, and what the working group has recommended, as Brett said, is to create, you know, to really figure out what is the universe of things that our examiners claim? What are the things that they say they can do, and what's the support for that? 
because the error rate is very likely to be different. Good or bad, you're not gonna have one error rate that adequately encompasses the entire realm of what a handwriting examiner does. So it's important we know that. We also made a recommendation that it, practitioners have a working knowledge of the relevant research. So this um, recommendation was framed mostly in terms of admissibility. I think our handwriting examiners felt there had been some bad admissibility decisions in handwriting that related not necessarily to the science, but related to the examiner who was testifying's lack of knowledge. Um, however that's framed, I think this is actually a good recommendation because it requires examiners to know things about this, the scientific support for their claims. And actually the recommendation is quite nitty gritty. It tells the examiner they need to know things like sample size, composition, test condition, and, and specific findings of the study. I think this is a, actually an interesting recommendation to think about in terms of the switch to likelihood ratios because we're telling examiners they have to really, they can't be operating on their intuitive belief reinforced by training and experience that they're good at this or that they know what the science is. They really have to know it. And that, that relates to likelihood ratios in an interesting way. They have to really understand the likelihood ratio approach as well, which is hard and I think something that many people, including lawyers and judges, struggle with because it's not something most of us are familiar with from our lives. And so the recommendation really is putting examiners on notice, at, you know, both for themselves as scientists but also in terms of admissibility of their discipline they really have to know what's there. And I think the report actually goes a long way in helping examiners understand what the science is out there. Okay, questions? Any questions to Dan? Mark. that distinguish the kind of data that you look at handwriting um, in contrast to the kind of data which characterizes um, a molecular structure or alleles in the database of DNA where there's discrete data and either that data has been identified and then you draw a conclusion including likelihood ratios and frequencies occurrence or likelihood of occurrence. And handwriting in which you don't have discrete data, um, it tends to be continuous. So if you're looking at a series of E's in the handwriting example, how E's are created as a continuum across the entire spectrum of totally readable and identifiable to those that are not identifiable written by the same person. So if they're isn't the street data, what problem do you have as a handwriting expert in trying to determine the data to which you are going to apply likelihood ratio someday? That's a very good question and very hard. I think there are some, so there have been some efforts, including made by members of our working group, including Tom Bastrick, to actually create, sort of attempt to create discrete data, so actually have create databases of features in handwriting. So what, it, I'm, I actually don't know enough about his measurement set or how he created those measurements, do you? No. <clears throat> there there it has I been some effort that. at that. I mean, you're hitting at a, part of what you're hitting at is a complex problem, which is to some extent handwriting is very much like other feature comparison disciplines in which we look at a feature and we compare it to other features and see how they match or don't, how, how similar and how different they are. <laughs> To some extent, that's more complicated because we don't expect them to look this, a handwriting examiner would not expect that a known writing and a question writing are gonna look exactly the same. They're trying to create, I think, some range of variation and determine well, how far out of the range of variation is this. Another problem that sort of underlies that is that while there are some aspects of handwriting analysis that are very, as I said, very clearly sort of classic feature comparison, there are also aspects that are less like a science. and. I, I'm struggling to find the way, right way to articulate that, but have more sort of a technical expertise. So for example, like an, yes, like an art historian. So we know our handwriting examiners, for example, tell us that German writers write their capital letters twice as big as their lowercase letters. Is that an idea that's really subject to empirical testing? It probably is, but it's also some other kind of expertise that teaches somebody that, or the sort of expertise that says, 
you know, people who grew up in Georgia in 1950 were probably trained on this kind of cursive writing versus another kind of cursive writing. So there's a whole other sort of mushier area of expertise that could probably be subject to black box testing, but doesn't really, isn't subject to the same kind of frequency arguments that we could see in other pattern comparison disciplines. Does that answer your question, Mike? Gentleman in blue. Uh, I have a question about that sort of related to the first presentation. It seems to me, I um, just want to know what your thoughts are about how you create incentives in an organization for doing it correct, because I think history teaches us that a lot of organizations have disincentives to correct errors. That's absolutely true, and I think that's something Melissa and her work is very focused on, and making sure that because you know you folks are working in the criminal justice system and I can't tell you that if you make a mistake and you come forward that you're not going to get on the stand and a defense attorney isn't in the zealous representation of his or her client for which that client has a constitutional right going to try to ream you. I can't say that's not going to happen. That's what our system does and is. I think the emphasis has to not be on the legal system then because that's not going to change. We have an adversarial system. But on organizations and help organizations understand that you know, the duty to correct shouldn't be seen as a punitive or awful measure, but in fact, you know, the noble service of the ideals of science. Like, that's what science is. And it shouldn't, maybe even duty to correct isn't the right frame. I don't think scientists and research science say we, we really have this duty to correct. They say science changes, we learn new things, and to the extent we've relied on things that weren't right before, we just change that. So I think there are ways to create those institutional cultural shifts it's not something I'm expert in, but people like Melissa are. And I think there are ways that labs and professional societies can encourage this kind of behavior in their members, even though the legal system isn't really, isn't set up for that and isn't gonna change in the way that is treated. And I would just say that culture shifts are the hardest changes to make, right? But it, it requires this understanding that by um, discussing errors and being open about them, it improves the system and it reduces the uh, the risk, the error, some of the risks that errors carry. So it's 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 not anything uh, easy at all. Um, and I just wanted to make clear that in this report, um, we weren't able to reach consensus on a lot of uh, on on some hard topics and where. Uh, the working group didn't reach consensus. There's some discussion about what the um, what the perspectives were around uh, around the issue. So you'll also see areas uh, in the report um, that reflect that. Uh, but we knew that we were getting somewhere when we would have practitioners say, raise their hand and say, I agree with what Dana's saying. <laughs> you know, about three quarters of the way through, you know, when, when you had unlikely pairings of, of people reaching consensus. Um, I just want to acknowledge that there are also people in the audience who are on the latent prints, if you could raise your hand. Uh, so if people are curious about what it's like to be on uh, these working groups, you know, you can approach us up here, but also there are some other people in the audience that have lived through this sometimes grueling uh, working group process. All right, well, thank you. I think, um, Matthew, we have one, more question. one more question. We have time, Matt. Yes, go ahead. Well, I'm just curious about your um, discovery uh, recommendations. Um, do you think that affects the defense bar? Because I know in the New York rules, the discovery obligations of prosecutors are, are very clear. And when uh, the defense only has to um, disclose a report, the defense experts seem to go through a lot of effort to avoid writing a report or write a report at the, the very last moment. Mm -hmm. So if you're talking about uh, equating civil and criminal um, discovery, do you think that will affect the defense bar significantly? No, I don't, because of the constitutional protections that defense <coughs> defendants in our system have that don't adhere to the prosecution. It's more complicated for a defense, for a defendant to give over information to the state that implicates all sorts of constitutional rights that aren't implicated by the ordinary discovery rules that a prosecutor is subject to. Um, and certainly, you know, it's acknowledged examiners can't themselves 
push forward this recommendation. It's not a recommendation to examiners. It tells examiners, or examiners themselves have, puts them in the position to say to prosecutors, we think this is, you know, my science is good, my science is sound. There's nothing to be afraid of by disclosing somewhat more to the defense, the same that we would do in a dispute involving money than we have been previously doing. It's up to, frankly, up to legislators, but also up to individual prosecuting bodies and district attorneys to decide then what, what they decide to do with that. But this is a reflection of the belief of examiners, of the scientists themselves. This isn't just my view, this was the view of the working group, that this promoted justice rather than hindered it. Matthew, did you have a question? Duty to correct. It's a big topic. Um, I'm supportive of it in concept, but obviously the devil's in the details here. So from an attorney's perspective, when you have a handwriting analyst testifying in court, they see their aspect of that trial. They don't see what may happen in closing arguments or how their testimony may be um, twisted, turned, whatever, by either side. Do you feel like they have a duty to go and review the transcript or something like that to correct what might have happened? I know we've had some discussions at this meeting before about that. And then to Brett, how functionally would you see that happening where you testify in potentially tens of cases a year, hundreds of cases over your career? Do you need to go back regularly and review those, what you said? How functionally do you think this duty to correct would apply to a practitioner? So that's a very good question and a very hard one. And I think when you see the report, you'll probably be disappointed in how we've answered it, which is that it's, you know, a tiny paragraph when we could have written, a, you know, a novel on the subject of the duty to correct. I mean, you're hitting on the hard problem, which is that one of the many hard problems in this area, which is examiners don't have access to everything that happens even within the trial itself, including, as you say, closing arguments. And as I'm sure many of the examiners and attorneys in this room know, one of the things we see all the time is prosecutors, and I'm sure defense attorneys too, overstating or misstating forensic evidence in closing arguments, um, even when the examiner him or herself has given scientifically appropriate testimony. I don't think the report necessarily puts an onus on the examiner to get transcripts and try to you know, chase down every, you know, every way in which a prosecutor or a defense attorney might have made you know, extreme errors or misused his or her testimony. I don't think the recommendation requires that. I think what it's talking about is to the extent that you, I think it requires the examiner not to put his head in the sand, right? To not be willfully ignorant about changes that happen in his or her field. I think it requires the examiner to when he or she learns of something. So it, I'm not sure it puts the onus on you to be extraordinarily active, to be going out there and really trying to chase down all the problems, but to be understanding that when changes happen in your field, you know, if. One, you know, one thing that we discussed a lot, probably because it comes up in the context of the FBI, FBI hair audit, but if, you, if you're a professional society, if we used to say in handwriting, and this has happened, well, let me give you an example outside of handwriting. In forensic dentistry, the American Board of Forensic Odontology over the last several years has changed its acceptable guidelines for testimony. Before, for many years, forensic dentists were able to say, I've identified this person as the biter. In recognition of changes in science, the ABFO has now changed their guidelines and now they can't say that anymore. They can say someone is not excluded, excluded, or inconclusive. That is the kind of change that's really significant to somebody who's in prison or even to a, into a civil matter or other, all kinds of contexts that this work might be done in. If that kind of change happened in handwriting, I think that does put an onus on an examiner to at least think about his or her cases in which he might have given, he or she might have given testimony that isn't scientifically supported today. I think it's unlikely that kind of shift is gonna happen in handwriting, but it's not beyond the pale to think that in, there could be major shifts within the way the organ, within the way the technique is used and understood. It's also not out of the question that there could be, as I've said, changes in assumptions. Maybe you happen to learn that some assumption you made isn't founded anymore. I think that does put the onus on you to go forward and act. Um, I yeah, I would, I would just comment that I think it was uh, to the extent that the examiner is aware. So if they realize that um, as they go back to the lab that they misspoke about something, they have a duty uh, 
ethical responsibility to convey that to, to the court. I don't think we took it to the extreme extent of reviewing everything. I think it was more as science changes, uh, things that they're aware of in the course of that conversation, what they said in court um, to address it that way. Although it's a good idea, if you have those transcripts, it's a good idea to look at them and you might see that you know your science is being misused or abused by attorneys. Not that we would ever do that. No, it, we wouldn't, but it, it also shows how your testimony impacts and is received by the other people. Matt, are we out of time? Can we go from... Okay. Well, we have Mark here. correct in the report. Um, but this comment is really um, a request for ABA and, and for the entire stakeholder community to try to put their arms around the issue of duty to correct. There are incredible ambiguities and conflicts that exist among the practitioner community because we are part of the adversary we are not part of the adversary system in analysis or in reporting or testimony, but inevitably, the duty to correct has gates that we have to abide by. So we don't have ownership. And I'm not sure that anybody has specified what that ownership is. And perhaps the APA or the Innocence Project, somebody can help create a framework that all of us can understand and agree with so that it's just laid out exactly what happens. And while the commission made an attempt with their code of ethics, I think the last piece of, of uh, duty to correct was truncated um, in the final version. So we're, we're still without guidance, which is actually written and accepted by all stakeholders. And it shouldn't be that hard to do. That's um, a very fair point. So I, I don't know, Matt, you can take that back to the ABA or whatever, but I think it's, it's um, you know, it's the 80-20 rule. It's not going to be that difficult to do, and the benefit of having clearly enunciated rules make it easier for forensic practitioners to know, what's my duty? How far do I have to go before I'm in violation of not doing anything? The back end of that, which is what do you do when you realize you have a duty to correct and how you get it out to the responsible people in the community has been studied and implemented to an extent in Texas. So there are, there are examples of how you implement a situation where the duty to correct involves hundreds of cases, perhaps. I mean, we see it in Massachusetts and in other states as well. It's when do you realize you do have a duty to correct that I think you're absolutely right on. It's hard to determine what the process is to be in a position to recognize it, and once you do, uh, to act on it. Paula, you look like you wanted oh. to say something. Were you raising your hand? No, oh, I was going to. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Just a comment as a follow-up to Mark's comment. I would suggest that in any kind of recommendation regarding the duty to correct, that it be that the group that propose, proposes it or works on it be bipartisan as opposed to partisan. I think it will be much more resident within any community as opposed to being something that is merely self-serving for one party. And I don't mean that as a criticism. I mean that as a recommendation for, uh, for balance within that. Well, it, and isn't that what was done in the FBI here? Uh, we yes, did, exactly. It had DOJ, the Innocence Project, exactly. the FBI, and you all worked together. And right. you certainly exhibited a duty to correct by doing that, as, as well as in the uh, lower lead analysis where we contacted through the Department of Justice those individuals who had cases involving that type of testimony. Right. So that duty is recognized, I think, in the community. Uh, I just hopefully want, we don't have to do it too well. I just want to follow up on one point about um, the, the question about what the report does with defense reports. I, it just occurred to me that actually in, in a sort of roundabout way the report does address this because it because of a recommendation towards either universal accreditation or following the accreditation standards. Accreditation requires the production of a written report in all cases, including defense cases. And actually, I've had the experience of labs telling me, or private examiners telling me, I, whether you want this report or not, it has to be written, because that's my obligation or my accreditation requirements. So to the extent that accreditation, those requirements, those recommendations are followed, 
it does implicitly force any examiner, private, not defense, not to produce a written report. It's up to the prosecutor then, I, then I guess, the discovery rules about how he or she would obtain that, but requires it to be done. Although many defense experts just aren't accredited, so. That, yeah, no, I, I agree. And we've made the recommendation in the report that they all be accredited. So we've, we've made the recommendation we can't make anyone do it or not. And Dana, with respect to that, wouldn't you draw a distinction between the consulting expert and that right. expert who has been identified as a witness for the case? That is, yes. Although I think that, I think as Cloud Labs, accreditation requirements don't draw that distinction. Whether those reports are discoverable turn often, I think, as many discovery rules, including the federal rules about whether it's a consulting expert or a testifying expert. But the accreditation requirements basically tell you how to produce the report. May I recognize Professor Reisinger? Do you have a question or do you? No, I was just, I didn't want to get in front of the camera when I returned to my seat. The reason I was asking you is because the professor, the good professor, was one of the reviewers of the report, so I thought he might. But back here, we have a question. Well, I had a comment about the requirement to write a report. And the ISO requirement is, unless you make an agreement with the client that is documented, you have to write a report. So there is an out within the ISO requirements about not having to write a formal report if there's an agreement with your client. So there has to be a formal agreement with your client that there is. Right. And I think in the report, you will find in that discussion that if there is a out written into your policy, then you don't have to write the report. I think that was the accommodation that was made with some of the civil document examiner members on the committee. So you're absolutely right. That's right. That mostly came up in the context of our civil examiners, not on the defense side, the people who do civil litigation. All right. Now, I'll say, I mean, I agree with the previous comment. But the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. The issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within the ISO requirements. And I think that the issue of whether there's a formal agreement is one that is not within
in the uh, enthusiasm to defend what you have come, the conclusion you've come to, you say things that are beyond what you ought to have said. In that situation, it seems to me that you can have an individual duty to correct, which does fall on you. And you are in a position to know it because when you get back to the lab and, uh, or wake up in the middle of the night saying, you know, I think I went too far there, that's when your own duty to correct may come. Thank you. Do we have more time now? Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Oh. Um, Andy, I'm just curious. When you, when you talk about handwriting being similar to other pattern recognition disciplines, there is one difference with respect to handwriting and other pattern recognition disciplines, and that is that handwriting is variable. So, for instance, fingerprints remain the same. Handwriting changes. So, one of the questions I have. One of the questions I have is, when you're doing likelihood ratio, or frequency of occurrence, you know, feature occurrence, um, most of the, I, I don't think they really ever capture the full range of variation within a right. So how? Realistically, most, realistically the recommendation to move to likelihood ratios is not actually a recommendation that people move to a likelihood ratio where the hypothesis two on the bottom is not going to be some kind of random match probability style of frequency. I mean, that's just be, totally beyond what we know about handwriting. Even the strongest supporters of handwriting would not say that that's a thing that we could do. I mean, it's in many ways, it's a recommendation to move towards, more explicitly towards the European model of get, just explicitly giving a subjective likelihood, which we sort of do all, which we essentially do already, just framed in different terms, which is going back to what I said earlier, a lot of what we're talking about is a shift in the way it's communicated, but not actually a real shift in what and what the science that underlies those, those ultimate statements are. Thank you very much. Thank you.